Thank you very much. Of course, I thank the organizers for this kind of invitation. Here's the title of my talk. Uh, Modular groups over the quaternions. Let me see if it works. I mean, it, since the time of the great Carl uh, Friedrich uh, Gauss, one of the most fascinating and important objects in mathematics is the modular group and its action by isometries on the upper half plane. This group, which is, consists of uh, Moebius transformations, I don't know where's the pointer, is it consists of Moebius transformations AZ plus B over CZ plus D, uh, which therefore is the group of matrices with integer coefficients, uh, determinant one, quotient, the identity dimension. This group is fantastic, we all know, has implications in things like number theory, Fermat's last theorem, uh, uh, coding, infinitely many things. And therefore, uh, it is natural to, uh, well, this is the beautiful picture. This is the picture of the, of, the, of the modular group. So this is the tessellation. Where's the pointer? It's right on top. This one? Yeah. OK, I see. OK, so the, you see this, this region here. Uh, this region is the fundamental domain of this group. Namely, if you take this region, which is actually a triangle, ideal, one point at infinity, and two angles of 60 degrees, of area pi over 3, if you take this uh, fundamental triangle and propagate it on the reaction of PSL to Z, we all know, I'm telling you things that you know, but in order to motivate my talk, well, you tessellate you, with mosaics, beautiful isometric mosaics, the upper half plane. So this is a picture of it. This group actually generated by two, two transformations, translation by one, and this transformation, which is, you see this point is I, the fundamental imaginary unit. This is a rotation 180 degrees around that one, and that's, so if you compose a translation followed by, inver by inversion, you, this point is fixed, and therefore the composition of this one with that one is a transformation of order three, which has fixed point. And one can see immediately that just from this, that these generators generate a group which is uh, uh, isomorphic to the free product of a group, cyclic group with two elements by the cyclic group of three elements. And uh, uh, you want the fundamental group of the collected sum of projective, of projective space with the length space. I like that viewpoint because it's very geometric. And anyhow, that's a group. And therefore, it is natural since C is not the only field. The quaternion is another field, not commutative, but it's a division algebra. We, a natural question we ask, can, what can we do in the setting of the quaternions? And so for this, we define the quaternions. They, we, have, we have a problem. The problem is that too many H's, H's so please keep track. H for, for quaternions, H for Hamilton, H for hyperbolic, H for Hurwitz, H for the... Uh, what? Hermitian. Hermitian. H for the, for the, for the form what, that appears in your notes for, the, for quadratic groups. So it's a universal H. So be careful of the So you have this H, blackboard H, is, uh, is, the, is the division algebra of the quaternions, which naturally identify with R4, associated to, to this quaternion, the core point with course X0, things that you know, such as R4. And, uh, and we define the hyperbolic half space like that one. Notice that here, since there are three imaginary units, it's better to choose the real line as the vertical axis. Otherwise, there's no democracy. You have I, J, and K. So you use that one. And to be more precise, this is the, the uh, so here's another H. So the, this would be the half space, consists of quaternions whose real part is positive. This will play the role of the upper half plane. Now you have to twist your head and look the other way around like that, to the right or to the left, and that is. And uh, of course, we provide this space with hyperbolic metric, which is this is a Poincare metric. And as such, you know, it's a complete metric, it's simply connected, a unique, complete, simply connected space of curvature, of Gaussian curvature minus one, the model we all talk about, so I don't need to repeat it. And I will be saying things that we have been, as you have seen in the, during, the, during the school. Uh, it's not, nothing wrong to repeat them, even if you know them. And so you have that. And now consider 
Obviously, the analog is the group consists, consisting of two by two quaternionic matrices. So A, B, C, D, and quaternions. This is called GL to Z. And well, we, we mimic, the, we mimic the, the, the Moebius transformations using the quaternions and being very careful which side you multiply. If you are dyslexic, you are in trouble. So you have this. This is our favorite group, homography, homo, a group of homography, homographies, Moebius transformations. And so we be very careful. We do a usual thing. We compact, we take the one point compactification of, of the quaternions, which pain R4 becomes the sphere, S4. And we act this way. Be careful. Here, this is to the right. You cannot put QA. You have to put AQ, et cetera. And this is a, is, is a, is a, a quaternionic linear fractional transformation so associated to, to each matrix. We associate that. And of course, with standard conventions for infinity, you know, exactly like you do in, in the case of, uh, OK. Uh, well, if you take uh, the, the set of all uh, matrices here, you can see, you can identify that with, with GL. You can think of these as eight by eight matrices if you write the, no? And therefore, you have that, the following definition. So this, there's a canonical inclusion of F, this, this group of matrices, into GL are A, invertible matrices uh, eight by eight, because H times H is uh, canonically isomorphic to, as a real vector space. Therefore, you have, you have this definition. All this in the book by, by John, John Parker, you want, or many other places. And then uh, th you have this theorem, the set of quaternionic matrices a group with respect to the composition operation. And you have a canonical math whose kernel is plus or minus the identity. OK, so you have this completely algebraic uh, thing. And uh, well, now you may wonder what the analog of the set of Moebius transformations that thick the disk. Well, we know by our complex variables that Moebius transformation that fix, fix the disk is, are exactly of this form. It's a Moebius transformation where you, we have to take not the absolute value of A less than one, otherwise it inverse the orientation, takes the inside to the outside. And so here you can see immediately that this group is parameterized by the disk times, uh, times S1. Okay, things that we know very well. And we want to see what's the analog. Here's another age that has nothing to do with any of the other ages. Uh, so you take this matrix, this Hermitian matrix. Well, you take, as in the, as in the lessons by, in the book by, uh, you take the Moebius transformation that preserve that. And there's this theorem. The set of Moebius transformations with preserve the disk is exactly that one. And I mentioned that just to show you how this is exactly that. You see? C minus A, Q minus Q zero. It's exactly the same formula, except now this e to the i theta, which is a complex number of modulus one, you need two quaternionic numbers, one on the right and one on the left. And this is a beautiful formula to express all the isometries of the disk in a concrete way. Uh, well, we gave a <laughs> there are proofs of that in, in several papers. We give that simply observing that this, uh, this group depends on 10 parameters. You count the parameters. This V is unitary, so it's three. U is unitary, is three. Three plus three makes six. Plus a point in the interior makes four, six plus four. And then you just counting parameters, you see that this is the group of, of on the other hand, the, the ball, the unit ball, let's keep going uh, here. OK, so this wave transformation preserves the Poincaré metric of the disk. The Poincaré metric of the disk is that one given by that one. Exactly mimics the case of the complex. And you see that this uh, Moebius transformation is isomorphic to the group of isometries of the ball. And therefore, in, in, in your, your, the school, you saw the analog of that in the complex ball. And this was the subject, was the pre protagonist of all the talks, practical detox, but this is, this is that, OK? Well, now uh, you compactify that. You see that they obviously the, 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 the set of transformations that preserve the ball is a subgroup of, 
Okay, one of the fundamental facts is the various transformations that I put at the beginning, no? AQ uh, uh, plus B multiplied by CQ plus D inverse in that order. Uh, we see that with the convention of infinity, this is precisely coincides with a set of all trans conformal transformation of the sphere of dimension four. And that means that precise orientation and precise angle. Now, there's a famous theorem by one of our common heroes, because we are here. There's one man that is called Henri Poincaré, so should be a common hero. I know that for Petrman, it's, it's, it's obviously we know that. But uh, therefore, a Poincaré proof that you can any conformal map of the sphere, you can extend to the interior as an isometry of hyperbolic space of five dimension. And therefore, you see there are many relations of groups, subgroups with others, and this interconnection of groups is what makes this theory incredibly rich. So you have, <laughs> you have this, you, you have the, the set of conformal mappings of S4, since can be extended to isometries of, uh, of, um, of the disk, hyperbolic disk dimension five, it acts simply and transitively on the space of frames. The space of frames is equal to five, time has dimension five for the base, and then the frame is S of four. So <coughs> this group has dimension 15, and <coughs> it's a, it's a thing. On the other hand, in the lectures by Pepe, and, uh, you, ca you have another interpretation of that. You take the action on, 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 this, on the quaternionic plane, it's action on the left lines. There are right lines, left lines, like, as I mentioned, the joke of politics, like politics, I choose the le left, what was the left, the left lines, and this group's act, so this thing was, was given already in the lecture by Pepe, and therefore, uh, we see that uh, there's an, it can be interpreted as a projective action in the quaternionic plane, and uh, therefore, the quaternionic plane compactified becomes S4, and well, now there's a, a fantastic injection. Uh, so you have that. The group of things that preserve the ball is a super, therefore, or the super conform. But you have all these inclusions, no? And uh, these things were given, I think, are in the lecture notes. I don't know if I'm in the lecture notes by, by you. And uh, well, here I repeat what I'm saying. Uh, no, uh, the Poincaré extension. The, this is just, uh, I go very fast on that, just equality of rules, read it, read it is very, things that are natural, different actions of that. Uh, this is important. Any orientation preserving conformal map of the four sphere has the property that it sends the set of complex structures at one point in the set of complex structures in another point, because preserves angles. And therefore, there's a natural extension into uh, into, uh, into the set of uh, uh, PSL 3C, and that's, makes, that's what makes it so rich. The interplay between twister spaces, conformal geometry, hyperbolic geometry in five dimensions, complex Kleinian groups, they are all in one same, and that's what makes the theory so incredibly rich. And, and many of those things have already been been uh, exposed in, during, the, during the workshop. OK, but now we are going back to the real source of my talk, which is this. So we want to consider the isometries of the half space. Remember, the half space consists of quaternions whose real part is positive. The upper half plane, upper, take it with a grain of salt, is the right-hand side plane, but call it the upper half plane. And uh, well, via the Cayley transform, look at the Cayley transform, you say you have Q plus I, but since we, we are saying, declaring the right-hand side plane, this is the actual, uh, the actual K, K transform is a little different. And, uh, well, we have, uh, the, uh, we want to, uh, to study two, isomet two is isomorphic groups, the ones that preserve the upper half plane or the unit ball. It's the same thing because the K transform changes one to the other. And so we can do any of the two. Uh, Well, we have this theorem. The set of conformal maps of the offer can play the same thing. Huh? What are those two references? 
<laughs> uh, those question marks because it's cut and paste. That's, it's probably referred to my, pa to my paper, to my paper with Pepe. Uh, okay, so, uh, well, we want to see, so which ones are preserved the upper half plane? And now, there a little bit of history here because some things will overlap. Very little of what I do here will actually overlap because has, has been done. Okay, so in the first place, as was explained already by John Parker, is this person, Theodor Valin, I, I only talk about his mathematics, who introduces in 1901 the idea of using Clifford numbers to define Möbius groups and using Clifford matrices. But this was taken by Alfors in 84, and he defines, he gives conditions of matrices. Uh, now, the Clifford numbers, the quaternions are a special case of Clifford numbers, and so he gave conditions of the Clifford numbers. And as these conditions are complicated, as John Park said, they have to preserve the vector space of dimension four, and the conditions are rather complicated. There are two conjugations, etc. And very recent, relatively recent, uh, Graziano Gentili and Cynthia Bisi, two Italian mathematicians from Florence, found a simpler condition, which is equivalent to Arthur's condition. So it's the following condition. Uh, what? condition is in my uvascular notes from before 2009. I think they refer to that. Okay. I thought, they, no, they say that they, they do some other things. But I, well, maybe John Parker, but historically, I learned it from them, but they refer to you. Yeah, you well. So this is the condition. Huh? So uh, I should maybe call the GBP conditions <laughs> or the BGP <laughs> conditions. Okay, so the condition is extremely simple. Is this, this relation? So you take the matrix, this matrix, this is a, an idempotent matrix, the square of that matrix is itself, and you take the set of matrix A, B, C, D that satisfies this condition. And uh, this is equivalent if you put it to these conditions. Maybe are the same you gave, these conditions. So all these three conditions are equivalent having this commutation relation or having these conditions, the, you know, these three conditions. This is sort of like a, you see, this is sort of like a, a determinant, okay? So this is the condition. So the group of invertible Lie transformations satisfying the BGP conditions consists of orientation preserving hyperbolic isometries. And we just call it Moebius transformations. And so we will use these, condi these simple conditions all over to see, because what I, what I want to do, what's the title of my talk? I want to define a modular group over the quaternions. So for that, I need the analog of the integers. And of course, we all have candidates for the integers, but we have to be careful to, and we have to do the things don't commute. Okay, so, uh, I repeat the same thing all over, you know. The upper half plane, these groups act out of the upper half plane, and therefore the, inf the, the infinity is the, will be the subspace of dimension three of unit of, of imaginary quaternions plus the point of infinity, that S3. That will play the role of the, of, the, of, the, of the real axis in the case of the modular group. Okay, I have that. Okay, so. Of course, people think about that. So groups which are generalizations of Picard and modular group were considered by McLachlan, Waterman, Willenberg. Uh, so they, they have a, something similar to the Lipschitz integers. And also Ruth Keller, has, who will speak now later, has applied these quaternions to, to study hyperbolic five manifolds, okay? And uh, well, this is a little bit of history. There are more than that. It's probably incomplete, but anyhow. So the first thing that makes a difference uh, is, uh, well, you have the, the affine group of, uh, web, of Webus transformations that preserve the upper half plane. So it consists of that. So it's a group of dimension seven. Is the one, this group is the one that fixes the horror plane 
real part of Q equals one. You know? So it's a fine group. Perdone? Eh? That would be another edge of calculation. Exactly. There are too many edges, though, unfortunately. OK. Uh, uh, so the, group, the affine group is the maximal subgroup which fixes the point in infinity. The same thing happens at dimension three. It's a real group of Lie group of dimension seven. It's a conformal group. And uh, it's, this group is obviously equivalent to the conformal group at infinity, namely the conformal group of dimension three. You have that. So I'm telling general, general properties. And then we have the analog of Iwasawa decomposition for this group. And it is the theorem. The matrices A, B, C, D, which preserve the upper half plane, or the real half plane, can be decomposed in this. Please remember how every, in S, for, for SL2R, you have this decomposition, diagonal matrices, even potent, unipotent matrices, and cos i theta, psi theta, but it is the analog. And this is beautiful because in particular, these conditions tell you that, that uh, sorry. These conditions tell you that this group, you see the group consists of alpha, beta, is another representation that I haven't seen anywhere of SO4. So SO4 consists of quaternions like that. So this is the Iwasawa, I haven't seen it anywhere, but I suppose it's known, like many. Uh, so this is an Iwasawa, you have to give a proof, we gave the proof. And, uh, okay, and now we come to the matter. Now, the, my, my conference started now. The previous was just background. So what are the integers? So we need rings within the quaternion, which are discrete and which mimic the, the, real, the, the integers. So there are two magnificent candidates, are the Lipschitz integers and the Hurwitz integers, both of which are very rich. So a Lipschitz quaternion, or Lipschitz integer, is a quaternion whose components are integers. So this is A, B, C, A plus B, G, plus C, J, plus D, K, where A, B, C, D are integers. This is obviously close to their quaternionic multiplication and addition, and therefore forms a subring of the division algebra of quaternions. And, well, you, you say, well, now I take A, B, C, D okay, matrices, quaternionic matrices with, with entries here, and that's it. Well, it's okay. That preserves S4, an isometries of H5, but they don't preserve the upper half plane because they must simultaneously, apart from the main, main must satisfy the conditions, the, the, the BGP conditions, okay? And therefore, uh, this is actually a subgroup of a much richer group, which is the so-called Hurwitz quaternions. Two great mathematicians, Lipschitz and Hurwitz, not only because of Lipschitz functions, because they are great mathematicians. And the, therefore, the Lipschitz uh, integers consist of uh, a, a quaternions written this way, in which A, B, C, D are simultaneously all integers or all have integers. No mixed, no mixing. And that's easy to see just by computation that is actually also a ring. It's close on the multiplication and addition. And this is another candidate to construct. Okay, so you can take the group of Moebius transformations with entries here. This is a discrete uh, subgroup of, uh, of, of isometries of why is discrete, as I learned from Joe Parker, because it's the final of a discrete group. I remember your anecdote, no? The set of integers is discrete. And so, but I want I them to be, preserve the upper half plane. So, what, what are the good candidates for that? Well, you see, here we are, here's the clue. The modular group, the classical and beautiful modular group is generated by two simple things. One translation and one rotation around, around one point. So we're going to mimic that construction. And so we take, first we have to analyze the quaternionic translations. So we consider translations of this form. One, W, zero, W, where W is an imaginary, is an imaginary quaternion, the real part is zero. This clearly translates and leaves invariant the right half side plane. So it's a beautiful candidate, now it's generated not by one, but by three linearly independent translations. So that's a beautiful, Beautiful group of translations, interested by itself. So 
you take the, uh, you take, uh, you take the group of translations consists of these, these are imaginary quaternions, consists of translations in which omega is imaginary. And then, of course, this acts freely on H3, has as fundamental domain uh, uh, what I call a chimney. Well, if you take H4 divided by this, what you get is a flat torus cross R. One end is a cusp, and the other is a trumpet. Going down is a trumpet. Trumpet, you see? And that's a very, very beautiful, but non-compact. And then, uh, uh, ah, now comes the analog of that, of that guy here. Is this translation, which becomes, in this case, really beautiful. It's really just inversion of quaternions. So I'm going to mimic what we do for the Bodera group. And I'm going to take the group generated by these translations and, uh, and this inversion. And now a theorem that I will prove, I will sketch a proof, is that the group of quaternionic uh, um, um, fractional transformations which preserve the upper half plane is exactly generated by that. Okay, so that the conditions, the simultaneous conditions, uh, BGP conditions, plus uh, no, are, are equivalent to that generated. It's exactly the candidate for the Baudelaire group. But now it becomes zero rich, the theory, because we have three translations, and we have so. Well, now T here is an analysis of T. T is an inversion or an inversion around the, so this is the imaginary quaternions. We have the, something I call the igloo, is the half sphere. This is one, and Q goes to Q minus one. It's a, 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 an antipodal map respect to that point. It's one of beautiful isometry. It makes the analog of that one is further two, and that's what we play a very. Yeah, exactly. I'm taking, yeah. I, you, so not, now a, a fundamental object. You know, the igloos in, in, in the North Pole before the, yeah, the climate change, uh, they had a, before all the polar bears died, no? Had this thing to open to have light, this cube, no? So this is the definition of C. C is a spherical cube central one with, with, of, of unit size. But let me, instead of doing that, let me, let me, I hope I have the picture here. This thing here is the, wait, no, I'm going too far. Okay, you see here, This will be a very important thing. You know, we'll play the role of one of the most beautiful objects we have in nature, which is this. You know, you all agree that we love this thing, you know? We love the modern orifice. Now, we replace it by this cube, you know, this segment. We replace, and that's play an important role. So C is this. But I gave the question, but just think of that. It's a spherical cube, and it's the intersection of hyper, half the spaces by, okay, you have that. And now comes composition, recompose uh, translations with inversions, and see what happens. For the modular group, we know, we we'll think, I think of order three, and, but what happens in this case? Uh, what happens is, this fantastic thing, you see, because it's very complicated. You, I want to put your attention into that, that. If you compose that, followed by that, you get something of order three. And if you see, you look carefully, this is the analog of that. But you know what? If you, you take the square, it's not the, the cube is not the identity. It's almost the identity, but it's, a, it's not the identity. And wow, you arrive to the last matrix. The last matrix is the identity, because remember we, 
the matrix that's negative are the same. And so that means that it's of order six. I was surprised because I thought it would be of order three. And what happens is something really amazing. So if you take this plane here, the plane, plane generated by one and I is invariant on the, on the data translation, so one and j, one and k, no? Depending if w is i, j of k. And therefore, act on this plane exactly like the modular. But you know what? It reverses the, that, that's, where the, that's where the six becomes. And then, now you can see that you, we're gonna play like the modular group, we're gonna start rotating along the axis, two dimensional axis, propagating, and the, <coughs> but the group begins extremely rich. So look at the relations are very, so you have elements of order two, elements of order four, because now in the cube, the cube has eight vertices. So you have rotations there. You have, has 12 middle points of edges. and have six middle points of faces. And so you start playing around, you have different orders, and you have fantastic group theoretical things and geometric things. And uh, so this is, this is, yeah, now I gave the definition. The, the Lipschitz modular group is the group generated by the three imaginary translations and inversion in the sphere. And the beautiful thing, this concise with a matrix with entries in the Lipschitz integers that preserve the upper half plane. It's a theorem, okay, not non trivial. Okay, you have that, not, not difficult, but you have to wheel. Okay, you have that. And uh, so, I mean, Depends what you take for omega. So remember, omega is, a, is an integer, an imaginary integer. And depending what you, what you take, you have different orders. You know, and you have all, all these, uh, you have fixed points. You know, this is a fixed point here for the modular, modular group. This is a fixed point of order three. Here you have a axis of order six. You have rotation around two-dimensional hardware planes. You have a very, very rich geometric, uh, 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 so this is the definition. The Lipschitz quaternionic modular group, finally, I come to my topic, consists of, is generated by the inversion T and the translations. And now you realize if you translate by one, that's not in our group because that takes minus one to, no, it doesn't preserve the off half plane, so this is a real theorem that you need to prove. Uh, uh, and now something beautiful happens. You see, they're really not, uh, what are the isometries that fix that? Nah. I mean, the, the, U, the quaternionic units, the Lipschitz units, are these ones. And you see, now you have this group, the group of diagonal matrices where U is a Lipschitz unit acts, belongs to our group, satisfies the BGP conditions, and therefore acts in our group, and is the group that fixes the horizontal, <laughs> well, obviously I don't know horizontal, it's a, the hyperspace real part equal, equal to one, and it acts, it acts by isometries there. Clearly, you can prove easily that this group is isomorphic to the Klein group of order four, so it's C2 plus C2, and uh, you can see the geometry of that, a rotation along the axis, and it's a finite group. And now we have something we didn't have in the, in the standard modular group. is the affine Lipschitz, you see? This is the Lipschitz parabolic group. Is a set of all elements of that form where B is a Lipschitz integer and U is a unit. So this is a, the group that preserves the, the hyperplane. That. And this is actually the maximal parabolic subgroup. So the option of this will be that if you take the upper half plane, quaternionic half plane, and divide by the modular group I just defined, this will be uh, orbifold of finite hyperbolic volume and one end. And the one end is a flat orbifold. is the quotient of the, of the horocycle at height one divided by this group that I gave you. 
and it's easy to see that the quotient becomes actually a cube, topologically. And now you have many, I mean, the, the modular orbit has only two conic points. It has one cusp and two conic points. The, our our well-known, uh, but now you take the, the quotient, it's extremely rich, it has many, many edges and ridges, you say ridges and points, and <coughs> beautiful geometry. We can compute the volume. We give a complete, I won't have the time, we give a complete description, detailed description of the orifice structure. Okay, this is the first group that we see. And, uh, well, here you can see that, that's the same thing, you know. Okay. But now we enter into the Hurwitz group. Remember, the Hurwitz groups are richer. Contains as a, as a, as a, as a subring the Lipschitz. So you have a, well, you see now the units, the inverted, inverted elements in the Hurwitz integers consist of these elements here. All 16 combinations are, are, are possible. So these are numbers that such that they, they, have, they are invertible within the integers. And uh, it's already a very geometric. This group is of order 24 and is known as the binary tetrahedral group. Its elements can be seen as the vertices of the 24 cell. The 24 cell is a convex regular for polytop whose boundary is composed by 24 octahedral cells. You can read six meters in each vertex orthogonally and the phases give an ortho system, like the one studied by Ruth Kellehurst. And uh, if you use the Kelly transform, you take and uh, you have this beautiful football, one of these that you learn from uh, Felix Klein, you know? It's a regular solid whose faces are octahedral, a beautiful object, you know, invariant. And this is gonna play, this is gonna be part of our game here. And uh, and uh, you see, you have, now you have the analog. All matrix of that type where U is a, a Hurwitz unit is uh, preserves the upper half plane. And uh, it's of order 12. And now, uh, how we define the Hurwitz border group? The same game as the border group. We take T which is the analog of that, and we translate, but we translate with the imaginary part of Hurwitz integers. It's a group. What is that group? That contains a subgroup of what previous. Though. So this is my, what's the structure? What's the orbital? You know, what can I say about that? What is fundamental domain? What is presentation? What is scaling graph? Any question you have asked for, you have asked for the modular group, in the, you can ask now. You play, and of course it hasn't escaped to us, that we can mimic many of those theorems. No? And that's what we are doing exactly. So you have that. And well, you have now uh, uh, the, uh, the, the analog of the affine group. You see, for the modular group, you don't have not, there's no, the only affine group is translations. It's not, not very interesting. But in case of that one, it's very rich, the group. You have that. Uh, and now, you see these matrices here. You take U. A uh, Hurwitz unit, you know, of the of the, of the 24 that they were, and you construct these matrices that I don't know how it came, we came down with that. There are 24 matrices, and this exactly by using the KD transform, the vertices of the 24 cell, and so that's the interplay between the 24 cell hyperbolic geometry and the constructions of many hyperbolic manifolds of dimension four manifolds and orifolds using will be arithmetic, of course, using these groups. So you have that. Well, I call, uh, we call them the Pauli matrices because they are finite. <laughs> There's no reason. And uh, here I say why we call them the Pauli. And this, these 24 elements in array are the vertices of the 24 cell. So we, I consider the group that preserves this famous cube, no? three-dimensional cube in the half sphere, you know, 
And I want the group, because I want to find the fundamental domain, I want that. Okay, so now, this is stereographic projection of the 24 cells. Is a, the picture is due to my, to one of my, my collaborators, is Fabio Blachi from Fiense, Florence, and Juan Pablo Diaz from my institution, Cuernavaca. So this is the 24 cell, which in Schlafly terms is 343. Uh, And this is, the, this, is the, this is the theorem. This is the really the remark is the, is the theorem. There are these discrete subgroups and define the, the Hurwitz modular orbifold and the, okay. Okay, but what about taking this cube, everything this above this cube, namely this figure, the analog of that, and take, it, take its, uh, its inversion. You think that white, that black, and you consider, well, this, this, this object here is a, is, a, is a coxeter polyhedron, it's a convex polyhedron with one vertex at infinity, and all angles are rational multiples of two pi. And therefore, you can play the, our hero, Poincaré, and reflect. And you have a tessellation of H4. Uh, but uh, so this is the, this is, I didn't find the last time. This is what I have. So this, part, this here on, on the bottom is R3, but actually as the space of imaginary quaternions. And then you take the half sphere, three-dimensional sphere. You take that, and then you uh, you see you see this. It's why I try to put there, and you take propagate by 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 reflections on the sides, and you get a non-orientable uh, kaleidoscope of hyperbolic. And what we do, we'll subdivide this into little pieces to see the fundamental domains of the Hurwitz group and, the, and see if you can manage to find the Cayley graph to give presentation. This is like a too easy presentation, beautiful, but and we will see that the other will be free products, so will very complicated. No? And uh, that's the reason I described to you the unitary groups, because they, to see elements of final order, no? how they go. And then you have that. So this is just a... This is just a description of the polygon, P. Well, we have a vertices, one-dimensional faces, two-dimensional faces, three-dimensional faces, and one solid, no? It's a description. You can compute the order characteristic is 12. Well, this is it. That's what I say. I say it by words. If you take P and TP, this satisfies the the Poincaré condition, so you propagate. And if you take the inverse, that one, the bottom, and now you have a, a subgroup of index two, now you have a, finally we have a or, hyperbolic orbit for the dimension four. And then, of course, what we'll do is use Selber's famous theorem to unfold it and to get infinitely many examples of hyperbolic manifold. No? It's, that's easy said than done, and it will be the analog of certain things that are under, under construction, like Congress subgroups, et cetera. And so now, uh, so this is the orientable orifold. You take the double pyramid. I go fast about that. I describe it geometrically, you know, I just told you that. Take this pyramid the, with vertices at infinity over the cube in the igloo, inverted, you have a double pyramid, and then Take this group of orientation percent words of order two, and tessellate the plane, take the quotient, and that's that's our first fundamental, fundamental hyperbolic orbital. Uh, and now comes the the actual computa actual computation. So this formula we know very well in the case of uh, of C. When we know that PSL2R, to prove that PSL2R are isometries of the upper half plane, 
the first thing you do is to prove this formula. Not the imaginary part, which of course now is the real part, satisfies this condition. This remains true, but now you have to be a juggler of commutation. Is this it? <laughs> because you have no commutativity, it's very much non trivial to do it. The main point of this theorem is to have guessed that it was still true in the quaternions. And then you have to juggle. So the proof is uh, this. You make computation, computation, continue the computation, use the BGP conditions, continue, and here we finish. So just pure computation, no? but I tell you the merit is to, this is still true, to have faith. This is still true even in a non-commutative case. So this has important consequences, no? Because it will tell, is the key for this corollary if you take a point and apply the, the Hurwitz or, 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 or Lipschitz, the height of the orbit, the, the imaginary part, namely the real part, remains bounded. And that's a key thing to prove what is rigorously what is the fundamental domain. Okay? And this is the fundamental domain. You prove that you can bring on the de modular group, any point to this fundamental cube, the pyramid of this. Once you are there, you are not finished because you still have things that move points, namely the unitary group. And that means that the fundamental domain will actually be the union of two cubes because still you have the unitary group. It's not a fundamental domain, that thing. You still have things that take something inside to something inside. And then the final option is this is the fundamental domain. And here, you will be able to cut and piece. You know, fundamental domains are beautiful because you can cut and glue, and then still fundamental, maybe disconnected, no? Take one piece here. And then you cut with scissors, hyperbolic scissors, cut and paste. And what you get actually is so beautiful as fundamental domain will be the cone of the rhombic dodecahedra. And this is uh, the work of art of pa Juan Pablo. And this uh, is obtained from the cube, standard cube, by crowning each face with a pyramid. So here you put a pyramid, here you put a pyramid in such a way that these two are like that. And so what you have is this rhombic dodecahedra. Has 12 faces and which is a rhombus. And this is one of the few things that tessellate you can see because you tessellate by cubes, you take the middle points and refine it. And that's beautiful because that it tells you how to, how to, how the geometry of the Lipschitz modular group looks like. Okay? Uh, a priori is that is. Uh, I have difficulty. Uh, okay. Okay, so here you have, this is the fundamental domain of the, of the, of the, of the so the union of two cubes here. And the other is the union of two pyramids for the Hurwitz, you know? Those are the fundamental domains. Then you can, and then uh, this is the way of color paste to obtain that. It's a beautiful design by Juan Pablo. And then we understand the geometry of the orbit. We understand the fundamental domain. It's like we are playing, instead of playing with the modular group, now we play with this one, no? and we have that. And, uh, and these are the theorems I told you. The characterization is given by the groups we define just by translations and inversion, concise exactly of the Moebius transformations, which preserve the upper half plane, and with entries in the Lipschitz or Hurwitz conditions. Once you have back for that, to prove that, we use the existence of the fundamental domain and all, this, all the things that we develop. Uh, well, this is the analog for the Hurwitz. Uh, and now you see 
we still can refine our fundamental domain to a finer thing that has more symmetries, the so-called Coxeter decompositions. And uh, so this cube will have a pyramid, simplex, which you can think of some color, that will fill each of the fundamental domains. And 48 of them will fill. And then uh, many of them will fill the 24 cell. And that, therefore, will make the, will link these groups with the 24 cell, and therefore with hyperbolic manifolds, which are canonically were constructed by, by, by Radcliffe and uh, Root, by, by Chunk, etc., cetera, no? connected with things that are already done, but are described in an arithmetic, in an arithmetic way algebraically. So, so this is the, okay, so you take this, delta L I will tell you what it is, is this piece. You see you have the cube, the fundamental cube has 48 of those triangles. And therefore you propagate those ones, that will be the fundamental domino piece, okay? This will allow us to compute volumes to, to uh, to do many things related. So the cost of compositions has 48 tetrahedra. So what we do is the follow, so this is the cube. I almost, yeah, it's a little later, yeah. Okay, anyhow, I want to show you the, well, these are the notation of Schleffli, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. It's just a notation, but what I want to show you is, okay, this is, this is the interesting thing. This little piece of Coxeter is a polytope with these angles. And that's what you propagate using, yeah, and this will be a piece filling each of the fundamental domains, and from this everything will be, from this we'll get the silver covers, because what do we want? We want finite index subgroups that are actually manifold, not orifolds. But we with an extremely detailed, uh, in our papers, about you know, say 60 pages, get a tail of all the orbifolds, et cetera. Uh, okay. Okay, that's, I say that in words, you take this little piece, blah, 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 blah. Uh, well, maybe I'm, go, I'm gonna go a little faster because I'm getting, my time is, uh, I spare more time uh, trying to chase the, I'm doing something non-fundamental, actually. <coughs> Okay, so with this little piece of domino, we fill the 24 cell. We know, the, we know how to compute volumes. We compute the volume, and the volume is equal to 4 pi squared over 3. And with this little piece also, we will describe the Coxeter, I mean the Cayley Kale graphs, just by looking at the fundamental domains, and we'll read the relations and describe the, describe, give an explicit presentation like that one of the different groups. Okay. Well, this is a, a okay, you take the tiny little, little uh, fundamental domain, this tetrahedra that I show you, and you the group generated by reflection of that certain group, and now you have this group. Each of them is a subgroup of index respectively 4, 12, and 3. And from that, you can, you can compute. Therefore, you see, the orbifold, the, 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 the ellipsis orbifold has volume p squared over 73 and the volume of the is 2 pi over 216. So you see, three times that is that. Of course, because fits three times, no? So that's how the volumes of our, we can explicitly compute the volumes of, of our orifice. We can characterize all the different uh, properties. You see here, very interesting, you know, these numbers that appear, appear here, you know, how many subdivisions you have. A number theoretically is very pretty. Uh, I think you have to, I don't know if this works. Uh, ah, 
Ah, oh, this is a beautiful picture. I mean, it's just to tell you, I mean, I learned from Thorsten that you get, you imagine you in immersive hyperbolic space, you see the tessellation, you see something beautiful. This is schematic, of course. And I, Royce Nelson is very kind, so I was asking him, I can you say, of course, use them. And it's the courtesy of him, very, he has a very beautiful page. With a, so this is more or less what you see if you get our, our group. No? And uh, it's, all, of course, only schematically. Uh, and now, uh, I don't know what, OK. OK, so the group is generated by the inversion T and the T3 hyperbolic transition. So what are the relations? These are, you see, elements of order 2, elements of order 6. Of course, my seal of theorem is not surprising that appear 2, 3. <laughs> but these are the relations. And these have to do with the different things you can do with the cube. You know, translate, rotate, rotate, you know, you know, twist, shake, and roll, 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 and roll, tum, 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 tum. And then you get all these relations. And it's a, you see, it's a very complicated group. It's much more complicated than that one. Of course, here and there, something we haven't done and we have to do is get free products. You know, a, a more explicit. This thing has been done also by the English school, like a MacLa Mac MacLachlan. How's it pronounced? I don't know. But yeah. Probably Bearden. By the way, some of the formulas we got coincide with the book of, Bill, of Bearden and make, makes us happy, no? It's correct, so therefore. And also this, uh, this is a generator. And the Hurwitz is a little bit more complicated. Look at what a beauty. I'm sure, well, these relations obviously many are, probably are superfluous. So it would be nice to get a minimal set of relations. We haven't been able to do that, but but we got the group. That's already that's already something. And uh, to prove that, you have to you see many interesting things. Uh, symmetries of the cube arrive, you know, and the binary of the cathedral group arrives as isotopy group of the, the has an enormous amount of geometric ge geometry. This is just show you how this will be used. Eh? Excuse me. Theorem. I should have written theorem because it was a lot of work. And here I have to thank uh, uh, I mean, he came, uh, Juan Pablo came to my house always with a toy, with a tinker toy. And all my, all my, uh, my grandchildren wanted to play, don't touch that, because we use it for models, no? So we were all the time, all the time playing with all the, also Fabio knows the, okay, so here, uh, so what about silver covers? So this will be subroots of finite index, torsion-free, which therefore will give you hyperbolic manifolds. Uh, OK, let me just perhaps just. Uh, so what are the minimal orders of? Like, you know, the order, the modular group has a super for the six that classical no, gamma zero that becomes becomes the fundamental group. I mean, I think somebody spoke about the six manifold, no, the puncture torus, the puncture. Well, here, the minimal has these orders, you know. This all comes from the geometry of the fundamental domain. Uh, then uh, here's the connection with the work of Rathke, a chance. Excuse me? A finite group acting on the silver Yeah. I don't know if they are normal subrows. No, they, they, they are just finite index. So I don't know. I, probably not. It, no, but I ha we haven't thought about it. So here is a. So using this, uh, this, uh, this, uh, uh, using this uh, uh, silver covers, I just finished with that. Using the silver covers, you have hyperbolic manifolds of finite volume, and the cusps are flat manifolds, torus, and therefore you can, can you say the, the tapa, the, you get what? Come see the tapa, you can, you can attach uh, T2 cross D2, whose boundary is T3, 
to have a compact manifold. And many times, this manifold happens to be S4. And this way, you get solid tori embedded in S4, whose complement is hyperbolic, a la, a la Thorston. And this they did by computer. And we now have this. Uh, we think this algebraic could be very useful. And Juan Pablo Diaz, a co-author and, and the one who wrote beautiful pictures there, uh, is given, has example of torite embedded in S4 whose complements are hyperbolic manifolds. And uh, this uh, part of this work is part of his thesis, also this, the one I'm presenting now. And uh, I think I'm finishing. Uh, many things happen here. Well, only to tell you that if you take, if you take the 24 cell, think of it in the ball. So at infinity, you have 24 vertices and 24 faces that are octahedra. And there's such a notion as opposite of octahedra. And then what you do, you reflect and translate, and you glue the faces to present to you by gluing and pasting a concrete, visualizable, hyperbolic, uh, manifold, not orbifold, but manifold, of finite volume, who costs, how many costs has, so Pablo? Five. five. Exactly, I already, I already comp computed once, but it has five, and it's beautiful, but now you, you, can, you can use the challenge of, they, uh, in their paper they use a Congress group for their two, we can use our group, we haven't done it, we'll do it. We'll do it. And of course, as I tell you, it hasn't escaped to us the many possibilities that we have like Bianchi groups, uh, modular forms, anything that you think, can you do that? We have thought about it. It's under construction. So with that, I finish. Thank you very much for it.